listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast with service members from across the military sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Welcome into the Hazard Ground Podcast. As always, we appreciate you joining us each and every week. Before we get started with this week's episode, I want to remind you guys to please continue using our partnership with Amazon to do all of your Amazon shopping. It's real simple. Go to our website, hazardground.com, click on the Amazon banner on the homepage, and it'll send you directly to Amazon. Do all of your normal shopping as you would. Doesn't cost you anything extra. Amazon will then kick back a small percentage of what you spend, and we'll turn around and donate that to veterans organizations that you've heard about right here on the Hazard Ground podcast. You can do it from your desktop or mobile device. Doesn't matter. And it's the easiest way for you to help out veterans all across America. So as a matter of fact, we were just able to make our second donation to a veteran organization featured here on the podcast, The Headstrong Project. If you remember back to episode 110, we had the executive director of The Headstrong Project, Joe Quinn, on the show. So this partnership with Amazon is working. Thank you guys for supporting us and supporting all these veterans organizations to this point, and please continue to use it to help out veterans virtually all over the world. Lastly, we do need your help supporting our sponsors. That's the main reason we have the sponsors page is for the podcast to help pay for the cost of putting out the new show and getting it out there to the listeners. And the more support we get for our sponsors, the more we can do to bring guests onto the show and improve the show, ultimately do more for you guys as well. You can help us by going to our sponsors page, hazardground.com slash sponsors and making a purchase from any of the sponsors that we have. It costs you nothing extra. You're just going through our website to get products that you'd buy anyway. And we've added a couple of new sponsors there. But if there are specific products or sponsors you'd like to see, let us know. Send us an email to producer at hazardground.com at your suggestions. And with that, let's get on to this week's guest. Joining us this week is a former West Point graduate who went on to become an infantry officer serving with the 101st Airborne Division. From there, he joined Special Forces, becoming a Green Beret, and ultimately ended up in the 1st Special Forces Operational Detachment, also known as Delta, where he was a part of such missions as the ones to Panama to capture Manuel Noriega, and also as part of Operation Restore Hope in Somalia, and of course eventually becomes part of the story of Black Hawk Down. You know it from the book and the movie, a story we've chronicled here many times on the Hazard Ground Podcast. He has retired Colonel Lee Van Arsdale joining us here on the Hazard Ground Podcast. Lee, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Mark. Good to be here. Okay, so a lot to get to. Everybody knows Black Hawk Down, and as I told you, we, we've told this story several times through different accounts, which, I, again, I find incredibly interesting because uh, when we say the battlefield is 360 degrees, everybody on it sees it in a different way. And obviously, for lack of a better term, the snatch and grab of Noriega was a, was a military operation that's certainly exciting. But we always start back at the beginning. You ended up at West Point. How and why? You know, I really can't answer that. I remember when I was 12 years old, I decided I wanted to go there. And, and to this day, I don't know why. But I got it in my mind, and so I followed through with it and uh, ended up there. You know, the West Point experience is always different for everybody. When you think back on your entire time there, what stands out to you about it? Once I figured out that it's supposed to suck, then it all made a lot more sense to me. So (laughs) it's a great opportunity for a young man, a young soldier in training. Uh, At the time, I don't think I appreciated it as much as I should, but uh, one of the, the greatest things I took away from that are the lifelong friendships. And I, you know, I still see a lot of my classmates to this day. When you say it was supposed to suck, what about it sucked that you remember? Oh, it, it was designed by brilliantly diabolical people. In those <laughs> days, they had uh, uh, the entire concept was last man standing. So it was an attritional model. In, instead of a uh, developmental model, which at some point in time in the interim years, they change, of course, now developmental, which, if you think about it, makes a lot more sense. But in those days, it was all about attrition. So um, whatever they could do to get someone to say, okay, I've had enough, then then they would do it. And then you had a just a crushing academic load. And I, I did not go to uh, high school where you had calculus or physics. And um, while I thought I was good at math. As soon as I got calculus at West Point, I hit a brick wall. And then you've got uh, mandatory foreign language. And uh, about the only thing I excelled at was the athletics. Well, you did play football at West Point, correct? 
Yeah, I like to say I was a team tackling dummy. I was the tight end on the scout team. So the coach would tell me to go out and catch a pass and let the entire defense tackle me, and that's what we did for an entire season. Yeah, I, I had a similar high school football experience, so you're not alone in that. But, uh, you know, when you talk <laughs> about, um, you know, it being attrition-based, I don't want to jump too far ahead, but do you think that helped you as you went through sort of the special forces assessment and selection? Because that is almost attrition-based. It, it was in those days. Um, you know, same thing with Ranger School, the Q course, the the uh, the SFOD uh, assessment and selection course. It was all based on go out there and um, push people to their limit and see who's left standing at the end. So I, I think in, with respect to that, mentally I was prepared for that. And then certainly um, everyone has to do what they can to prepare themselves physically and emotionally. You know, when you graduated from West Point, a uh, different era, uh, and not to kind of date you age-wise, but you graduated in the mid-'70s, and uh, Vietnam had just ended. Uh, not that there was a ton of conflict going on in the world, but what are you feel, thinking and feeling about the next phase of your life and the beginning of your military career when you graduate? It was an exciting time. I mean, I'm commissioned as an officer in the United States Army. I go through airborne, uh, infantry officer basic course, ranger school. And uh, then when I show up to my first duty station, Fort Campbell, Kentucky, with the 101st Airborne Division, uh, I'm put in charge of a rifle platoon. So, you know, that's a lot on the plate of a young man uh, who just got out of uh, what we used to call the un-college. Very exciting time. And and while the Army was pretty much at its nadir in those years, like you said, post-Vietnam, in terms of small unit tactics and the ability to go out in the field and be an infantryman, be a soldier, uh, that was a perfect time. People may not know this about you, but you actually left the Army for a short time, correct? After your service commitment? I did. I was uh, nearing the end of my my uh, time there in the 10th Special Forces Group, which I absolutely loved. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven when I got there. But you can't stay there forever. And so um, Infantry Branch was telling me that my time as a, uh, a detachment commander didn't count as command and that they wouldn't send me back to a troop unit to command an infantry company, which is really what I wanted to do. And so they're talking recruiting command or ROTC, all of which are obviously important, not what I had in mind for myself. So I resigned my commission and then quickly had an epiphany that I love being a soldier. And if you're going to be a soldier, you got to be in the Army. So uh, after that, I I applied uh, for readmission uh, to get my commission back, and they gave it to me. And, of course, in true army fashion, the first job I got was a rifle company commander. <laughs> you took the shortcut. Um, let's talk about the idea of going special forces because, you know, at the time when you were in the military, one, it wasn't a, a big thing. Like, you know, it wasn't advertised, certainly not the way it was now. And I can remember when I was a second lieutenant and I was at Fort Hood and I remember I, I always remember driving past a sign and I saw it and I never knew what it was. And I wish somebody at the time had told me and educated me and said, look, this is available because this is, again, prior to 9-11. And I'm sitting here and I look back at my career and said, you know, if somebody would have told me that this was an opportunity I could have taken advantage, I would have tried. But I never did because I didn't know it was available. So how do you come across the idea of special forces and what attracted you to it? Well, it was always out there. Um not really advertised, you said. I had a captain come into my battalion who had just come from Special Forces, and I talked to him about it. And he encouraged me to apply for it. I called Infantry Branch, and they actively discouraged me. But um, like I said, once I got something in my mind, I, I was going to go for it. And so uh, I finally did get a slot in the Q course after haranguing the assignments officer for long enough till he got tired of me. And... Um, that, that was a great experience. That uh, you know, Ranger School was the greatest leadership school out there. The Q course, in terms of filling a head full of useful knowledge, uh, I've never been anything that was that could stack up to that. And then, like I said, I got to ten special force group at Fort Devens, Massachusetts, and was absolutely in heaven. When you look back on the way they conducted things then, and your knowledge of how they do things now. 
I understand that a lot of that has changed because the world has changed and, you know, the environment with which we operate in has changed. But uh, has the has the, you know, assessment selection and Q course done a good job at staying out in front of all that? From what I see, they've done an exceptionally good job. And we didn't have the A&S phase when I was there. You, you started in the phase one, and if you didn't make it, then you just got booted and uh, they'd find a place to put you. So I think that aspect of it is better. Um, I think overall um, they're doing a better job of selecting the cadre. Uh, I hate to say this, but that, that was kind of a last stop for a lot of people in their career in special forces. Now it's more career-enhancing and you get just top-flight people there at the Special Warfare Center in school. So when you were in 10th Group, and, and again, obviously we have things going on all over the world regardless that you know special operators take care of, um, but you know what sort of things were you doing on a day-to-day basis? Was it just training in the States or was there actually, for lack of a better term, mini deployments and things that you guys had to handle? Compared to nowadays, there there were nowhere near as many deployments overseas. Um, we did a lot of training. Fort Devens did not have a large training area. We trained throughout the New England states. Um, a lot of the 10th Mountain Division veterans from World War II, when they came back, they opened ski areas around New England and, and in the West, of course. And uh, they just opened their arms to us. If, if we showed up there, they would they would allow us to train in their areas. And then um, there were never enough hours in the day. You know, the, the goal is for everyone on 18 to be cross-trained. And so we had a language requirement. Uh, I wanted everyone to, to be up to speed in Morse code and communications and, of course, first aid. Um, uh, all of the engineering tasks, uh, there's always something you have to do. Okay, so fast forward, you get out of the military, you come back in, you get the infantry company command you want, and then you decide that um, you wanted to go to special forces, uh, you know, Delta, uh, you know, SFA Delta for a special forces group. Does somebody bring this to your attention? Were you selected for it? How does that come about? I had just given up command of my rifle company, and I was the commandant of the 172nd Light Infantry Brigade Air Assault Course in Alaska. And every morning, my NCOIC and I would go to breakfast before we went to work just to compare notes and get everything uh, level set. And uh, the evening prior, he said, uh, I won't be able to go to breakfast with him. I have a mandatory briefing for all NCOs. And I asked him what it was, and he told me it was for the Delta recruiters. I said, well, what the heck, I'll go along with you. And uh, everything they said resonated with me. So I raised my hand, and uh, in, in those days, we were critically short in commissioned officers, so they were excited about that, and uh, they give you a PT test and a few other things, and um, then they make the determination whether or not you can go to the assessment and selection course. When you find out that you can go, are you excited, you, is this, or is this kind of like another step for you? No, I was really excited about it. Um, I didn't have any G2 at all up there in Alaska. You know, if you're a Fort Bragg or if you're in a Ranger battalion, uh, even one of the SF units, then you've got a lot of good G2 on it, but I had none. So going into the unknown like that is always an exciting prospect. Do you think, are you the type of person that you think if you had the information ahead of time, it would have made it easier or would it made it harder? I don't know. Uh, I don't have a frame of reference for that. Logic tells me it would have been easier. Um, but on the same token, when you think you have something wired, you probably don't. So it could well have been harder. Yeah. I mean, I, I asked that question of a lot of guys who go through this or, you know, Navy SEALs or whatever, how much research do you do? Because sometimes, as you said, if you would have known it, it sucked, it might've been easier to handle. In other cases, guys would rather not know how bad it sucks and just deal with it one day as it comes along. Right. I mean, it's easier sometimes to go with it when you don't know uh, what is next, but if you can build it up in your mind that something's going to suck a lot worse than it does and it makes it harder. Yeah, I think that's true. So when you go through uh, Delta assessment and selection, um, how, what are we talking as far as amped up versus regular special forces? How much different is it? How much harder is it? Uh, is it a lot just more knowledge-based and things you have to know, or is it physical? Like, give me kind of some, as much as you can, obviously. Give me some of the, the uh, things that were different about it. 
Yeah, without violating any confidences, sure. uh, I'll tell you that it's a combination of physical, mental, and emotional. Um, you're tested every day, every minute of every day. Uh, you're convinced that there's always someone watching you or surveilling you somehow, even if they're not. And and that in and of itself uh, can take an emotional drain on some people. You never know how you're doing. That wears on some people. They never give you any feedback. So you you don't know if you're if you're knocking out a ballpark or if you're taking a swing and miss every day. And, and you don't know how long things are. So it it really is a uh, it's a brilliant way to find the people with the right skill sets that you're looking for. And for the non-military listening, you have to understand, like, we grade everything in the military, right? There's a standard, there's a task, condition, and standard for everything where we tell you at the beginning, this is where we are, this is what we want you to meet, and this is what the end state looks like. And so when you have none of that, it's almost like operating blind to a certain extent, correct? Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, You don't know what your task is until they give it to you right then and tell you to execute. The conditions are pretty much uh, (laughs) your degree of situational awareness. And you don't know what the standard is until they say, okay, get in the back of the truck, you're you're through here, or congratulations, you just passed this phase of the selection course. Ultimately, what you do, uh, you get accepted and you serve in Delta, um, and you spent the next, uh, I think, 14 years of your, your career there. And so... As you mentioned before, when you were in 10th group, there wasn't a lot of, you know, operational stuff going on. Did you notice a difference when you got to, when you got to Delta? Yeah, there's a, there was a very big difference and, you know, even more so today, post 9-11. Um, in, in many different ways. I mean, the level of professionalism when I got to 10th group was just off the charts. I, I loved working with those experienced NCOs. And it was even more so when I got to Delta. And then the, um, for lack of a better term, the self-policing aspect of everything. When everyone is a top-level professional, then they all take care of themselves. When, when I was a squadron commander for almost three years, I didn't have one Article 15. I didn't have, even have a letter of reprimand. Um I, I wrote one counseling statement, and that was for a commissioned officer. <laughs> so it it truly is a different dynamic than what you have in a conventional unit uh, or even in a special forces unit. Now, again, for those non-military listening, just understand the nature of what Delta does. There's so much of it that is clandestine for a good reason, and I won't ask you to, to even – I know you won't, but I won't ask you to divulge any of that, obviously, because you can't. There's certain things that you just can't talk about. Um, that said, there are certain events that automatically get thrust into the spotlight uh, because of the nature of what they are. One of those was um, Manuel Noriega in Panama in 1989. Now, we have kind of touched on this um, from different angles with other people, you know, pilots who are part of it and things of that nature and, and people who are on the ground there. Um, but as I understand it, you were one of the six people who actually went and, and physically grabbed him, correct? That's correct. Okay, so... Since this is now a, 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 as much as is unclassified that is there, I, I kind of want to get your the background on this thing. When you are going into Panama, what are you told ahead of time? What can you tell me? Uh, it was interesting. We, you know, we've been prepping for this for almost eighteen months. To, that long, to varying degrees. Yeah, and um, you know, a lot of what we prep for never never turns into a, a deployment order. This one, six months out, we actually started rotating squadrons out of Panama on a three-week basis because it looked like it was uh, getting to a higher degree of seriousness. And so, depending on where you were in the rotation order, determined uh, which mission you had. So, um, job mission one was the apprehension of Manuel Noriega. Mission 1A was the rescue of Kurt Muse, an American citizen right. in the Carcelo Modelo prison. So we had just returned home from Panama. And when I say home, I mean Fort Bragg because we didn't have an opportunity to go home. They said, okay, repack some clean socks in your rucksacks. You're going back down again. That's exactly what we did. So our job was to apprehend Manuel Noriega and the intel people for 18 months, literally, 
had been telling us, we have this thing wired. We know where he is 24-7. Just let us know when you get the green light, and we'll tell you where he is. So we got the green light, and they shrugged and said, we don't know where he is. So ironically, the reason they didn't is because he ditched everybody, so he'd go to his favorite bordello, and he had to keep that secret from his wife and his mistress. Apparently, they were both jealous women. Uh, left his, his detail behind, had his driver drop him off and disappear. So he's in a bordello while the commandancy is in leveled to the ground, and no one knows where he is. So for the next several days, we had uh, over 24 missions on what we called Elvis sightings, where you know everyone had seen Manuel Noriega. He was not a popular guy in the country, and um, you know we're going to where something that sounds like it might be credible, maybe actionable. We're going to go do it, and we we never did find him. Finally, we got word that he was holed up in the Papal Nunciatoria, the Pope's embassy in Panama City. So we raced over there and surrounded the place, and sure enough, it turned out he was in there. He had claimed religious sanctuary as a good Catholic uh, there in the Papal Nunciatoria. What he did know is that when we took his home down, he we saw, couldn't help but notice, a Santeria shrine in the middle of the floor in his home office. So that's somewhat frowned upon by the Catholic Church. We took our intermediary, Father Joseph, who was the number two man there at the embassy. We took him to to Noriega's home to show him that. And that's when he realized that Noriega was, in fact, not a good Catholic, and they did not want to give him refuge anymore. So that ultimately led them to, to convince him to turn himself over to us. When you uh, when you have to go through this, and, and again, so much is up in the air. Um, how many times do you go through the iterations of thinking that you know this is a go, this is a go, only to stand down, and then finally getting the actual word that this is a go, and then you have to go? Like, take me through kind of the repetition of of day to day until you actually have to go. I, I can't even count the number of times. I mean, <laughs> you, you look at the number of incidents around the world, which was our AOR. And is this going to rise to the level of a deployment? And for us, a deployment is anywhere from one person to the entire unit to, to being a part of a, a, a joint task force. So you just don't know. So, you, you know, you're always analyzing things. You're, you're keeping an eye on them as they develop. Um, if it starts to look like it may creep towards a greater chance of deployment, then you start planning a little more and maybe doing some specific training towards that environment or that task and then uh i i would dare say nine out of ten of them never happened and so you know it's yeah it is disappointing uh, to a degree but then you've got the next one right on the heels of it so there's no time to be disappointed as it pertains to noriega and and the actual capture of him um, can you talk about the the operation itself and how it was supposed to be conducted and how much of it went to plan Well, when you don't know where someone is, that's the one key critical piece of information if you're going to go and apprehend them. So then it just goes down to what we decided to do is we would just chew up his infrastructure. We would take away those people and places and things that he needed for support. And the plan worked. He, you know, he popped and uh, made his way to the papal nunciatoria, and then we had him surrounded. So... I suppose he could have pulled a Julian Assange and stayed there indefinitely, but um, that's when he miscalculated by having the Santeria shrine in his home. Well, and the only reason I ask that, it kind of because it prefaces what, what went on in Mogadishu in a sense where, you know, the, the, the plan for infill and extraction was X and then Y happened, so to speak. W- did you experience that uh, with the actual operation to get him? By him, you're talking about Noriega yes, again? Yes, yeah, by Noriega. Yeah, it was, um, I hate to say this because it will sound cynical, but it was no great surprise when they didn't know where he was. And so we just started, um, you know, we, we went to his home, we went to his office, we captured his personal secretary, we captured his mistress. Um, and when uh, the interrogators told her where he was during D-Day, she got really irritated and, she, she 
provided some key information to help us eventually apprehend him. So that goes back to your questions about selection. You're looking for a person who can operate in a very amorphous, nebulous environment. Keep your focus on what needs to be done and not let the distractions that will inevitably be all around you in those kind of environments and with those kind of missions make you lose your focus. At any point during your time there in Panama, and and give me a second just to expound on this one word, did you feel unprepared? And what I mean by that is, you know, did you not have proper intel? Did you walk into a situation that you thought was going to be one thing and it ended up being another? Were were you uh, ever caught off guard by something there? I I can't think of one time where I had the 100% accurate intel. So, no, it, it didn't catch us off guard. And um, I can say I was uh, impressed with our level of training for every everything we took down, every building we took down, they were completely unknown floor plans. And, and the guys performed flawlessly. There were any number of times when they would have been justified in shooting someone, and they never did. It's that split-second judgment that, even though this guy is holding a pistol, he's not doing so in a threatening manner. And so they would disarm them rather than shoot them. So the level of training, the, um, the capabilities, uh, the people select in the first place bore out everything that, uh, we had been doing over the years in our assessment and selection course. And then the subsequent training. Actually capturing him, does that give you a sense of pride or is it just one of those things where it's, hey, that's our business, that's our job, and we move on to the next one? I can't say pride. I can say I'm happy that we did it, uh, just like any mission accomplished. So, you know, that, that could have gone uh, gone totally political and he, he had religious asylum and then you start negotiating and they... Um, take him to the Vatican or who knows what could have happened. So you're, you're always glad when you successfully accomplish a mission, as you well know. So I, I, I don't know. I can't say that I took a lot of pride from it. What I did take a lot of pride from were the guys that I was working with. They're, you know, they're just phenomenal soldiers. All right. So let's fast forward a little bit. Uh, you had you said 18 months sort of train up for Panama. Uh, it's 1992 and uh, things in, in Mogadishu and Somalia are, are starting to ramp up a little bit, uh, you know, in, in their political world. When's the first time you guys start hearing about Somalia and Mogadishu? That's been on the radar screen since their civil war started. I think, what was that, 91, 92, but no, no specific targets. So for Panama, we had the specific target of Manuel Noriega. In, in Somalia, it was just another country that, you know, <laughs> needs some assistance in numerous different ways. So no specific mission prep or rehearsals until the uh, Pakistani peacekeepers got massacred in June of 1993. And then that put us on the fast track to a deployment over there. When you go to a place like that uh, and you start hearing about it, how much do you yourself have to start doing some, for lack of a better term, scouting about the environment, about what's going on over there, or do you just rely on the intel you're told? Um, because again, you guys kind of go into situations operating somewhat blind. Um, do you start to do any of your own kind of scouting of, of what Mogadishu is about? Yeah, the, you know, there's a, uh a lot of different resources available. There's the DIA country assessment. There's the state country assessment. It's always interesting because those would differ so much. And then we had a fantastic intel shop within the unit. And uh, anything you want to know, you just go ask these guys. And if they didn't know off the top of their head, they'd find it out for you. And the, the level of innovation and insights and thinking outside the box throughout the unit there, the operators would always think up questions and ask these guys that I wouldn't have thought of. And, and I'd always say, geez, I wish I'd have thought of that. <laughs> you get used to that after a while. 
and it, it, it's a really healthy professional dynamic you've got going on. So when you guys actually hit the ground in Somalia, uh, give me that month and year time frame, and, and what's what's life like when you first get there? We got there in August of '93, and for decisions made way above my pay grade, we were staying on the UN compound, for lack of a better term. It was the Somalia International Airfield. The terminal and the hangar there had been bombed out. The hangar that we were staying in was essentially a landfill, so it took a lot of work to get that to where it was even marginally habitable. And we had our own secured compound within the UN compound because the way the UN operates is if you have, say, 10 different countries securing this sector, then every country is responsible for their own sector. There's no overall command. There is on paper, but in reality, country A could have virtually no security. Country B right next to them has top security. Country C, as you go down the line, could be somewhere in the middle. And then all the way down the line, you've got varying levels of security to include none at all, which means if you're securing a perimeter around an airfield that half of it is the ocean, so that's reasonably secure, but then anyone who wants to can walk inside the perimeter through one of the unsecured sections, then you don't have a secured perimeter. So we knew right away that we had to make our own compound within the compound, and that's what we did. Day-to-day life there in August into September, uh, how often are you guys getting spun up? How much do you have to go conduct actual missions before you know the Black Hawk Down mission kicks off? Yeah, we learning again from Panama, our job was to kill or capture um, Muhammad Far ID, the general in charge of the Harbor Gator militia. The Harbor Gator was a clan, and every clan had their own militia. That was the militia that massacred the Pakistanis. So our job was to get this guy, and we we didn't know where he was. The CIA had one asset who killed himself the night before we got there playing Russian roulette. And as you know, in that environment, the only kind of intel that you can use is human intelligence. So all the signals intelligence and photo intelligence, every other kind is pretty well useless in that environment. And we had no assets to give us that kind of intelligence. So the CIA was scrambling. We gave ourselves one week to get a uh, credible sighting of General ID. And then if we didn't, we would do the same thing we did in Panama. We'd start taking out his infrastructure. So after the first week, we took down six targets. All of them were successful uh, in in the effort to put the squeeze on them. And then the seventh one, as has been uh, variously misreported, was not an effort to, to get ID'd because we still didn't know where he was. It was a mission to apprehend two of his key lieutenants, which was exactly the kind of mission we're looking for in terms of putting the squeeze on him. And that was the third of October, nineteen ninety-three. Before we get there, I just kind of want to—I want to get the listeners to understand. Um, as you start to take down more targets, is this building up more confidence that when the call comes to go get a deed or you get some credible information, that this is going to be something that's not easy is not the right word. That it's something that you are as prepared as possible for. Yeah, one of our concerns in lines with that was the longer you have a, a unit like Delta deployed, the more you start to lose your edge because you can't train. If we're not deployed, we're training constantly. And if you're you're living in a barely habitable hangar, uh, part of a bombed out airfield, training becomes difficult. So we could do, you know, you go run around the airfield, you could do push-ups, but the, the real war fighting skills, uh, it was difficult to keep the fine edge on that. So that was a concern. And we'd, uh, we'd been there for almost two months before the 3rd of October arrived. So while that doesn't exactly answer your question, it does from an oblique way. No, and, and, and I get what you're saying. Um, I, I think if I can sort of maybe try to, you know, shed some light on it, the, the idea that, 
um, the only training you get is actual missions um, is a little bit scary because uh, I, I just feel like uh, operationally what I know about combat that um, sometimes that you can get a little lax, I guess is the right way to phrase it. Um, if you do the same thing repetitively over and over again, um, you, you stop, I guess your senses are less alert sometimes because you've been down this road before, so to speak. Is that fair to say? I, I think there's a chance that could happen. I certainly didn't detect that. Um, our biggest concern was uh, we only had three ways to get to any target in Mogadishu. You could walk, you could uh, drive, or you could take a helicopter. That's it. And you can try to mix and match as much as you can, but uh, the, the enemy weren't dummies. You know, those are pretty smart guys and accomplished urban warriors. They know that, too. They know that we could, we're driving, walking, or flying. That's it. Did the level of of resistance you met with each of these previous missions prior to October third did it get better? Did it did it become more? Nothing compared to the third of October because we went right into the heart of the Harbor Gator neighborhood in Mogadishu, so we knew we were going into the hornet's nest, and the the whole focus was to get in and get out before the militia had a chance to react. They had, they had uh, tremendous strength in numbers over us. And in fact, uh, everything went absolutely according to plan. It was a textbook operation until Cliff Walcott got shot down 20 minutes uh, after the kickoff of the operation. All right, so let's get to October 3rd. Uh, that morning when you wake up, again, because all this information is, is constantly fluid, I assume, um, it's not like, you know, you can get, hey, these lieutenants are in this building, you know, uh, and they're going to stay there for the next three days, right? It's, everything is kind of fluid. That morning when you wake up, uh, is it a normal morning for you guys? Is it just, you know, wash, rinse, repeat at that point? Yeah, I mean, there was a bit of Groundhog Day associated with it, and we did what we could. Uh, you know, you, you, you train to the extent possible. We did uh, signature flights every day, at least one or two where everyone would get up, run out to the birds, go fly around and come back just to desensitize uh, the Harbor Gator to what we were doing. So when we actually did a mission, when we did fly out, it was no different than what we've been doing every day up till then. So, you know, the movie Blackout Down, they're setting signal fires and all that. Now, they, they, were, they were pretty much desensitized to it. But as soon as we came in, into their neighborhood... Then it was on. When you get the plan for the day, I know you said it went to, you know, it went perfectly until one of the Blackhawks gets shot down. Did you ever have a plan that you didn't feel was a good one or one that pro- provided more questions than answers, so to speak? And, and I asked that in, in the vein of, you know, the same thing about October 3rd. Um, it went to plan, but, you know, was it the best plan possible given all the circumstances? Yeah, I think it was. Uh, one, one of the unique aspects of the Special Operations Community is all the planning is done from the bottom up. So that's true in Special Forces. It's, it's true in Delta. And so everyone conducting that mission is looking out through the eyes of an operator that's going to be on the ground instead of the eyes of someone in a headquarters element who's dictating who goes left and who goes right. So from that perspective, the plan was as good as it could get. Having said that, um, while, while we always did extensive planning, we probably did more extensive, con- extensive contingency planning because nothing ever goes truly according to plan. Right. It's important you have that plan in place, and it's important you know the commander's intent, but it's also critical that you have the contingency plans. Can you take me through your actual portion of the mission? You know, from uh, let's just go to the inc- the incursion standpoint. I mean, uh, you're on a helicopter, you fly in, you fast rope down. What do you do on that that beginning of that mission? No, I I have the inglorious job of being the officer in charge of the Joint Operations Center. Oh so, yeah, uh, kind of frustrating because that was my old squadron going going in there. That they were the ones in Somalia the whole time. So when Cliff got shot down, one of our contingencies was to activate the Quick Reaction Force, which was the 10th Mountain Division, not part of Task Force Ranger. They were part of the U.N. effort over there. Um, But, of course, we had their LNO and our JOC, and and we had our LNO and their operations center. So 
General Garrison immediately activated them, and when they came over to get last-minute briefings from us, from their compound, separate compound, he turned to me and told me to go with them. So we went out, we left the airfield, um, got hit multiple times in unarmored Humvees, and um, finally got to a place where the road was blocked. So we could we could sit there and try to fight it out with people entrenched in buildings on rooftops, alleyways, windows, with machine guns, uh, AKs, and a lot of RPGs, or, or turn around and reconfigure. So that's the decision that was made. And um, part of the reconfiguration when we got back was the acknowledgement that we did not have any armor. So we got Malaysian armored personnel carriers and Pakistani tanks, four of the latter, and went back out again later in the evening. It was a frustratingly long period of time for me, but if you think about it, you get three different languages with three disparate units that have never worked together and don't have any common operating principles, no no common tactics, techniques, and procedures. So... The fact that we pulled that off at all is a minor miracle. So we went back out, and this time, instead of riding in the back of a pickup configured on V, with my RTO right next to me, my radio telephone up there, we're in the back of a Soviet-built APC, which I never in my wildest dreams saw that happening. <laughs> so it's kind of comforting when you could hear the rounds plinking off the sides, and they don't even make a dent on the inside. Our plan was to go to a rally point between what was now two crash sites, Cliff Durant's and Mike Durant, uh, Cliff Walcott's and Mike Durant's. We'd send a company from the 10th to each site, and um, I decided to go with the company that went to the first crash site because that's where the assault force and the ranger security element was all located at this point in time. The helo went down just a few blocks away from the initial target. So that force was able to pick up and run over there, secure the crash site before the militia got to it. It was a pretty close close run race, but we won that one. So I decided to go there with my highest and best use being the prevention of fratricide. It's night, you got dirt streets, there's dust in the air everywhere, there's bullets, there's tracers in the air, there's explosions going off, noisy as can be, and you got one unit coming up on another unit. So I thought blue on blue was a very real danger to us. And so I would do what I could to preclude that. Take me back to when you're sitting in the Joint Operations Center um, and you see Cliff Walcott's Blackhawk get hit. What are you thinking? I think General Garrison, the task force commander, summed it up as succinctly as he could. He said, we just lost the initiative. And that's exactly what happened. When you're in, when you're that underarmed, speed and surprise is everything. And so we knew we couldn't just leave a down helicopter there. We had pilot and co-pilot, two crew chiefs, and four snipers in the back of it. So we had to get there, but it changed the entire dynamic. And as General Garrison said, who absolutely fantastic commander, we just lost the initiative through the night. We regained the initiative, but for the, from that at that moment, we had lost it. Well, you go from an assault to basically a you know a recovery mission at that point. I mean, you, the entire objective had changed, um, and, and and in the process, uh, you know, you, you these guys find themselves um, in a position where they are now defensive instead of offensive. Um, that's part of the initiative that General Garrison referred to. But you know, when you start to realize the amount of militia that's there and the amount of fire that they're taking. Are, are you surprised or is this just like unexpected? No, it's like I said, we knew we were going into the hornet's nest. So when you do that, you can't be surprised if there's a lot of hornets flying around. I, I would like to make one point uh, back to your comment. The mission itself was successfully accomplished. We apprehended the two lieutenants each of whom had about a dozen bodyguards whose sole mission in life is to eliminate any threat to their principal. Um, we secured all those guys, apprehended the lieutenants, and got them back to the base. So that's kind of been lost uh, by many in the annals of history. 
like I said, a lot of the reporting is just wrong that uh, we failed to apprehend Noriega on that mission. I'm sorry, Aidid on that mission. Um, that was not a mission. We never did know where Muhammad Aidid was located. So the mission itself was successful, albeit with a tragic loss of life. And it was one heck of a fight from about 3.30 in the afternoon until uh, well after sunrise the next day. Yeah, and, and, and I don't mean to gloss over that fact by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, you know, uh, militarily, uh, anybody who reads up on it would know that the operation was successful because it was exactly mission accomplished. And, and to that end, I don't think we can underscore that enough. Uh, but I guess what I'm, I'm kind of curious about um, from your standpoint is uh, when when – you, you get these guys and then all of a sudden you have this, I guess, let's call it tangential mission of now staying alive and, and getting everybody out of there. Um, you know, how does that operationally change, you know, I, I guess where you guys are, the mindset of everybody? Because, again, you plan for contingencies, but could you have planned for this level of contingency? Um. Uh, no, and the reason we couldn't is because we had a cap, a, a political cap, on the number of manpower there. We also didn't have some of the assets like the AC-130s that we'd rehearsed with, and in our mind's eye, it was part of our package, but did not deploy with us. Again, a political decision to cut that asset from the task force. So there's only so many contingencies you can plan for when you're limited on manpower and weaponry. When you start to hear that, you know, fellow rangers and operators are, are you know, being wounded and killed, um, how does that affect you personally, and how did that affect everybody else? I can only speak on my behalf, uh, and, you know, the guys I was close to and talked to afterwards all felt the same way. You, you have to absolutely fence it off and compartmentalize it and keep your focus on the mission. Some of those guys I'd worked with for years and was very close to, and, uh, I, you know, I still think about them and grieve for them every day. I will for the rest of my life. But when you're in the middle of a fight, you can't stop and feel bad about them. Let me ask you about uh, Randy Gordon and uh, or Gary Gordon and, and Randy Shugart, um, you know, the two Delta snipers who, uh, for lack of a better term, and I'm not being insensitive here, Lee, by any stretch, but it, they knew they were going on a suicide mission. I think they knew that they couldn't survive the numbers against them and chose to save Mike Durant's life. Um, those were guys who that you knew well and, and uh, you know, trained with and worked with. Um, did you know that they were inserting themselves into that whole thing, or did you find out after the fact? Yeah, first of all, I disagree with the premise. I, I don't think they were on a suicide mission. I don't think that's in the DNA of an operator. Uh, we may be overconfident sometimes, but usually that's born of our abilities. They saw a need and volunteered to fill that need. Uh, I'm sure they thought they could get in, develop the situation there, help anyone who survived and get out, or just establish a beachhead long enough for reinforcements to get in. I, I would dispute the notion that they were going in knowing that they would die. We're just not wired that way. And that's fair. And again, I hope I wasn't offensive when I said it. I just, you know, hindsight being the benefit and uh, knowing what how things unfolded through historical accounts, it just seemed the odds were incredibly against them. Is that fair to say? That, that's fair to say. And I, and I took no offense because a lot of people have opined that when I get the opportunity, I, I offer my opinion that I, I don't think that's the case at all. And that, you know, the, the way we're wired is if it's one chance in a thousand, well, hey, that's better than one chance in 10,000. Okay, so back to the, the point, did you, did you know that they were going in? No, at this point in time, I was pretty decisively engaged myself. Sure. Um, Gary Harrell, a um, good friend of mine, was the squadron commander. He was upstairs in the C-2 bird, so they had requested permission to go in from him multiple times. I, I don't even know how many, and he denied it to them. Finally, either he or then Colonel Boyk and the unit commander, someone along the line granted them permission. Um, as it was, there were no forces to follow on you know, had they established the beachhead, which I think they probably did initially. But two against however many hundred uh, 
sooner or later the odds are going to catch up with you. When you think back uh, about that decision that they made, uh, and again, some of this may be having the benefit of hindsight, how do you characterize it? It was absolutely selfless service and bravery at the highest. Uh, I, I would like to comment on the third member of that sniper team, Brad Holling. Brad was manning a minigun in the Black Hawk because the crew chief had got wounded, so they moved him out of the way, and Brad took that before Rainey and Gary went in. And so he stayed manning the minigun, and, and uh, that bird got hit later, and Brad lost a leg. But you, you, you'll never know. You know, if there had been a third operator down there, would it have turned the tide at all? Would it have made a difference? There's no way to know, but that's one of those... Um, peripheral stories that not many people know about. No, I, I didn't know that. Um, thank you for sharing that. Uh, all these years later, um, you know, when you hear about Randy and Gary and what they did and everybody, the whole thing, um, and, and you put it in the context, and, and I've heard you say to other accounts, you know, you talk about they got the two lieutenants and the mission was successful. Do you ever try to reconcile the loss versus mission success? No, I, I prefer not to go there. I mean, the fact is, even if we had gotten uh, ID'd on day one, I don't think it would have made much difference in the overall scheme of things. You know, someone else would have popped up and taken his place, and you'd have the same thing going on there. The uh, U.S. envoy over there, Admiral Howe, had uh, personal history, negative history with IT, and they didn't like each other. And I think that's why we ended up over there. So that that's not for soldiers to debate, and uh, we don't vote on whether or not we deploy. We, we go do our job. Well, I, I guess let me let me put it a different way, and let me – just personal opinion. Um, was it worth it? Was it worth being there for the amount of American lives we lost? I think, for me, being a soldier was an honor. So anytime I'm deployed in my nation's interest, then absolutely it's worth it. I I, I don't disagree uh, on the macro level. Now, this is from my personal experience. Like, I can tell you from the first time I deployed, deployed to Iraq in 05 to 06, where Things were kinetic. They were moving. I felt like we were making ground. We were, you know, we were winning. And my small piece of the pie, um, where I deployed, I felt like on a day to day basis was was having an impact. When I went there the second time in 2011 to close out Iraq, we were there just to leave, and we weren't kinetic. We were static, and we were in a defensive posture the whole time. And rules of engagement and change and everything else. I, I felt like part of me felt like whatever lives were lost at that point. Um, wasn't in vain per se, but could have been preventable or was more preventable because of the manner in which we chose to, to be there, if that makes any sense. You see where I'm going with it? Uh, I, I see exactly where you're going, and I read a lot of history. It's been that way throughout history. And uh, it, it's very easy to get frustrated by that if you let yourself. So sure. the key is just don't let yourself. It's If it's not my decision... And if I don't even get a vote in it, then I'm going to do what I can do to make the difference I can at my level. And and I, like I said, I grieve the lives that were lost, but they were there voluntarily. Um, they were soldiers. That doesn't mean they signed up to die. No one does. Um, you know, that, as you know, that's a misconception. But they were there doing their job, and, and they died honorable deaths. And that means something. Absolutely. Um, let's go back to the actual battle, because as it winds down, when you guys are getting out of of the city and, and back to, um, I think it was the Pakistani soccer or the, the soccer stadium that you were going to, um, as, that, as that thing is winding down uh, and you start to, you know, your adrenaline goes away and everything, uh, what are you thinking and feeling? Can you remember? I remember when we finally got there to the crash site, and that, that was, you know, some drama associated with that. I ended up walking point for an infantry company as a lieutenant colonel, which uh, <laughs> I don't think that's in any of the manuals. <laughs> but we, we were able to have zero fratricide incidents. And so I, I linked up with Scotty Miller, who, who 
whose name you may recognize. He was the assault force commander. Yep. And I was able to bring in the 10th Mountain Company. I say I. Obviously, it was a big team effort. Uh, was zero incident. And then my focus was on getting the trapped pilots and co-pilots' bodies out of the helicopter. We weren't going to make it that far and then leave them behind. Unfortunately, we, we weren't taking any significant casualties at this point in time. So it took several hours to get them out. And the whole time I was saying, we really want to get out of here while it's still dark. We have the advantage in the dark. Um, but we didn't. It was daylight when we got out. And I, I think that we had pretty much defeated the obligated militia by that point in time. There, there was a little bit of drama going back. Um, we were under fire the whole time, but we gave out a lot more than we got. And there were some alleys and scratches on the way back, but no one was significantly injured, and, and we didn't have any deaths, any additional deaths. So we got back to the rally point, um, loaded up the vehicles, went back. The, the, you know, the whole deal in the movie and the book about soldiers being left behind simply didn't happen. That was perception of someone at the back of the line that saw the vehicles around the corner and didn't see them again until we got to the rally point. So in, in his mind's eye, they got left behind and ran out, but I personally got it up from every subordinate leader that all his men were present accounted for before before myself and Scotty Miller loaded up and before the convoy took off. So you got little things like that, but I, to, to answer your question specifically, the biggest thing was get out while it was still dark, and as it turned out, we didn't, and as it turned out, that wasn't as big a concern as I thought it was. So uh, did the Mogadishu Mile, the famed Mogadishu Mile, that, that didn't happen, or it did? No, it did happen. It was where our rally point was, where we dismounted. We had to dismount. I, I was getting kind of comfortable in the back of that EPC, thinking I could ride all the way to the crash site. But they had burning roadblocks in the way. Um, and so we had to dismount and dismantle the roadblocks for the vehicles to make it through. And then we stayed dismounted to provide mutual support between the dismounted troops and the vehicles. And um, coming back out, and it was about 800 meters from the rally point to the crash site. Coming back out, we had our stretcher cases in the vehicles, so there was no option of mounted or dismounted. And so 800 meters in, 800 meters out, um, 1,600 meters is about a mile. Gotcha. Okay. Um, In the moments uh, after when everybody is out, uh, now granted, again, not everybody, because Mike Durant was in captivity for 11 days. Um, do you start to get a sense of how bad things were for you guys? And when I say bad, I mean the number of people who were wounded and the number of people who were, who were KIA? Well, that was pretty immediately known. Okay. What really hit me hard was a couple of days later, Matt Ryerson, who was by my side uh, the entire time in there, he'd been on the initial assault force, got killed in a mortar round, and it also injured Gary Harrell. So I was put in interim command of Sea Squadron while, while Gary was medevaced out. Um, that hit me harder than anything because it was so unexpected. You know, if you're in the middle of a desperate firefight and you get wounded or killed, that's not unexpected. But when you have a circle of people standing around talking to each other in the middle of our compound, a mortar shell lands right in the middle of them and kills one of the finest soldiers you've ever known. That hit me hard. When the decision was made to pull out of Somalia, what was your reaction? I was bitter at the time. I figured we'd been sent in to do a job and now we're being told that, that no, you're not going to do the job. Kind of like being having your team pulled off football field at, after the third quarter when you're winning, um, but you've taken some injuries, so they're going to pull, they're going to stop the game. When you look back on the entire, you know, sequence of events, um, d- do you ever grade how it went? Do you ever think things sh- could have, should have went different? Yeah, that's, that's human nature. You can't help but doing that. And, you know, our system is civilian control over the military, and it's a good system. Not perfect, but, but it's very good, and more often than not, it works. 
goes back to what you were saying about Iraq. You know, it was a political decision to pull out, which of course led to the rise of ISIS and, and all the drama since then. So not all the decisions are perfect, and, and even, even if we only had military people making decisions, all you got to do is read some history and you see not all of those are perfect either. Geez, read any account of World War One. Um, but it is a good system, and and I think it's better than any other system out there. It's just not perfect, and uh, it would be easy to get bitter about that. But that's that's counterproductive and pointless. Let's talk about the movie. Um, you know, Mark Gowden, Mark Bowden was a guest on the podcast, so we've talked extensively about it. I mean, I've I've read the book, um, and and way before the movie came out. But uh, you know, you were part of the. Um, I, I guess advisors is the best word, right? Uh, that, you know, was the military advisors that were on the film. Um, what was your biggest role in being an advisor and what did you want to see happen? My biggest role was the one I assigned myself and that was make sure that the movie paid a proper tribute to our fallen comrades. I didn't want it to devolve into another Rambo or, or anything of that nature. And I think they did a really good job of that. There were some non-factual incidents, and um, I, you know, I, I won more arguments with the director Ridley Scott than I lost. And I had Tom Matthews there; he was the air mission commander during uh, during the battle, and so he he knew everything from the air perspective, and I had a fairly good grasp from the ground perspective. So um, we had a lot of discussions with Ridley, who was just a phenomenally talented guy and, and a great guy, fun to be with as well. But we didn't win every argument. And as he pointed out to us on a daily basis, I'm not making a documentary. My job is to put butts in theater seats. Well, I'll say this much, just and this is personal opinion, and a lot of people I think share this pe- this opinion and people who have been in combat throughout the war on terror. It, it is the most realistic combat depiction out there of any movie that I've ever seen. Uh, I, I don't think any other movie, and not even Saving Private Ryan in that opening scene, I, I think I, I think there's too much Hollywood there, but I think what you guys recreated in the movie is as realistic to combat, I think, as you can get on a movie screen. Now, I'm glad to hear that, particularly from a combat vet who, who's seen urban combat, which, is, as you know, is a totally different yes. animal than yeah. anything else. And so from that end, I, I always appreciated... Um, you know, that approach. And I understand, look, you're trying to take 20 hours and squeeze it into, you know, two hours. And it's just, it's not feasibly possible to get everything in there in one shot. But I, I certainly have seen other movies. Um, you know, again, I, I think uh, things like Lone Survivor, I thought they missed the mark on a lot. Um, you know, if you read the book, I think they missed a lot of things there for the sake of Hollywood. But I thought you guys did a really good job. And I think the other thing that became really apparent um, in the movie, which um, you know, from an emotional component is the bonds between soldiers in war um, and, and, and how much you fight for the guy next to you. Uh, and, and it's perfectly encapsulated in that one scene at the end where it says they don't understand why we do it. It's about the man next to you. And, and that's something really, I think, truly, and not to disparage civilians, Lee, but they, they, they just don't understand that. They can't understand it until they put on a uniform. Yeah, that's exactly right. You you can't disparage them because there's no way you can understand it unless you've been there. When the movie came out and you watched it, how what was your reaction? How'd you feel about it? Well, I I didn't you know just sit down and watch the movie. I, I'd been with uh, every day after shooting. You'd go and watch that day's film with the director and hopefully <laughs> lobby for the scene you wanted. And, <laughs> you know, please don't put that one. The guy is, you know, I told them all have the muzzles down in the helicopter and you shoot 10 scenes and nine <laughs> of them, they have them down. And this one, this one clown has it up. So that's the one you keep. So, you know, you're looking for stuff like that. The, the technical stuff that uh, an artistic director would notice and you lobby for, for the one that you want. So I saw every day's worth of filming as it occurred. And then there were several, call them, uh, I don't know what they call it in the movie industry, I'd call it a draft, where you, you show it and then, okay, let's do this, let's do that, let's cut this scene, let's add that scene. Um, so it wasn't until they had a premiere, they had one in L.A. and one in D.C. that I went to, that I actually saw the finished product. 
And so that was fun. Uh, my family was with me. And, um, it, it, you know, when you see something polished up and finished uh, with the soundtrack and everything else, it, it, it really does bring it all together compared to watching the dailies and uh, with no soundtrack and, or with, you know, kind of a generic soundtrack. So it was a, it's a fun, rewarding experience for me. I wouldn't want to do it again, <laughs> it, uh, you know. 12 hours a day sitting in Morocco, <laughs> it got old. But for that particular one, I, I figured, well, if I don't do it, who else is going to? I did get use of sock approval for it first. I didn't want to run afoul of any of my old uh, colleagues. And the Army was very supportive of the film. As you probably know, they had active duty Rangers and 160th guys there participate in the filming. When you, you make a film like that, um, it, and I know accuracy is important, and that's the big thing for me, like it's just a viewer. You know, I just wanted to, to depict something that's real. Um, but the emotional notes that the film hit, we, I just talked about a moment ago. Did you feel like it did a good job of doing that? Like I said, I, I wanted to make sure we paid a proper tribute to our fallen comrades, and I do think that they did a good job with that. Back to the battle for a moment. I heard you say earlier that General Garrison was a great leader, um, and both in the book and they annotated at the end of the movie, he takes complete blame for the entire thing. I've asked a couple of people this who have been part of it. Did he need to take blame for the whole thing? I, I wouldn't call it blame. I would call it responsibility. Okay. And, Bad um, word choice. I own that. He, well, no problem. He, he said, I'm the commander. I take responsibility for what happened here. He's a smart guy. And he knew that as soon as one American soldier got killed, that people were going to go off the rails. You know, the default position of the press is who screwed up and who do we blame? And that's exactly what happened. And being the kind of guy he is, he stood up and said, here I am, take me. We don't see enough of that, honestly. We just, not even in the military today, we don't see it. I mean, and uh, I, I, like, like I said, he, he, he's a great commander, a great man. I hate to reference it because it brings up a lot of, you know, sore feelings for people, but the whole Pat Tillman incident, all it really took was somebody to stand up and say, it's my fault. This is what happened and it's my fault. And a lot of the negative stuff that, that was the fallout from that, I think would have went away. Yeah, I think you're right. And and General Kinziger, who ultimately got the fallout for it, I always thought he was a great general. Okay, so um, as you move away from the actual events of 1993, uh, you mentioned you still talk to some people. Um, you know, is that particular uh, you know event harder for you than any others throughout your military career? Does it does it stick with you in different ways? Um, in terms of the the number of lives lost, it certainly does. And, um, that can't help but to uh, impact you in different ways. But, you know, I, I was old. I was a 40-year-old lieutenant colonel when that happened. So that's way different from being an 18-year-old ranger on your first deployment. Um, it, it was certainly a meaningful chapter in my life. It didn't define my life. Um, and, and, you know, my life went on after that. If you were to come across uh, somebody who you worked with during the Battle of Mogadishu, what would be one of the first things that you guys would recount, do you think? You know, that's a good question, because everyone looks at things from their own 10 square meters of existence. Um, the, the Delta guys all pretty much have their way of looking at things. The Rangers have their way. The, the task force guys have their way. Um, but we're, we're all brothers. We all have that shared experience. So um, I missed the 25-year anniversary last year. I did go to the 20th anniversary, which was the first time we'd all gotten together post-Somalia. And it was just a good feeling. It didn't matter which unit you were in or what your rank was. It, it, that that was, you know, just a large group of brothers getting together for a family reunion. Were there a lot of emotions bubbling up about it years later, or is it just guys who can put their arms around each other and, and be thankful that they're still here? 
from what I saw, the emotional part uh, was no longer there, certainly not on the surface anyway. So it was a, it was a happy event. Tough question to answer because you had a very, very long career. But when you look back on your career, what stands out the most to you? I was able to be present when all three of my sons were born. So that's no easy task being a soldier, as you know. Mm -hmm. Are your sons in military service now? No, none of them are. They're, <laughs> they are such free spirits. Uh, I, I didn't think that would be such a good idea. <laughs> Did you try to encourage them or no? No, um, a couple of them were going to enlist, and I discouraged them uh, for various reasons, just based on their personalities. And uh, they're, they're all you know, adults now and doing well. Obviously, you weren't around for uh, the war on terror. You had been retired. When you talk to guys who are still in the special ops community now, and you compare notes from then to now, what are some of the differences and similarities you see? Well, the similarities are, are the guys have the same heart. They get the same focus. They get the same level of commitment and drive. The differences are the number of, of missions you go on, not on a deployment, but every night. And it, it really irritates me that I missed all that. <laughs> yeah, well, the timing, I guess, is the essence of life, right? Um, but exactly. operationally, are, I know we're better than we were back then, but I guess the question is, why are we better? We've got the most combat experienced army we've had in the history of our nation. You can't help but to get some lessons out of that and, and some battle-hardened troops along with it. Well, Lee, listen, uh, you've had an amazing career, uh, certainly some incredible high points uh, for the things that you've done and accomplished, and obviously um, everything that went on in Somalia that you were a part of is, is etched in history forever. So from that standpoint, um, you know, you've certainly uh, played a big role in that. And uh, to echo the things that you've hit on here, obviously, you know, the mission was a success, and let's not ever forget the lives that were lost there and um, the fact that they chose to give up their life for their country is, as you said, clearly noble, but um, your career in and of itself is incredible. And certainly I just thank you for, for your candor and honesty and being willing to share it all with me. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Lee Van Arsel, thank you for being part of the Hazard Ground. Okay. Take care. You've been listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast, hosted by Mark Zeno and produced by Matt Pascarella. If you have an interesting story to tell, and you'd like to be on the show, send us an email at hazardgroundpodcast at gmail.com. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.